thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I know that your branch is one of the most uh, um, energetic and enthusiastic in the whole of the European movement, and I'm always very pleased to be invited. Um, usually at the beginning, um, people say, uh, I'm speaking on my own behalf, I'm not speaking on behalf of the Federal Trust, um, but the Federal Trust is quite a small organisation, um, so I think it would be rather artificial to draw a distinction between Brendan Donnelly, private citizen, and Brendan Donnelly, director of the Federal Trust. Um, I think anything that I say here um, can be taken as being um, said in both capacities. I I'd like to start, if I may, with um, two quotations, uh, one of which is from Sam Goldwyn, the American media mogul, who said that if you don't know where you're going, you may well end up somewhere else. Um, the second quotation is from Winston Churchill, much more august um, source, who says that a fanatic is someone who's, when, he, when he's got what he wants, he's forgotten why he wanted it in the first place. And I think that both those, um, both those phrases are very applicable to Brexit. A second one, perhaps obviously so, there are very few Brexiters who are happy with the outcome of the Brexit negotiations. Some Brexiters say it leaves us too close to Europe. Um, others say that the UK has been forced to accept too much of the EU's terms. The EU has, um, has, um, has um, if you like, um, bullied the European Union into, the, uh, uh, into acceptance uh, of the agreement. Uh, every day, the problems about Brexit become clearer particularly for exporters. Importers are going to have exactly the same problem um, in the coming months as the formalities um, of the agreement, implicit in the agreement, come to be applied to them as well as to exporters, to British exporters. Um, don't forget that this was the Brexit that was supposed to put an end to bureaucratic formalities. In fact, it's the other way around. It's a Brexit, Brexit um, which has increased enormously uh, the formalities. The single market was itself um, uh, an exercise in abolishing red tape and abolishing bureaucracy. The advantages of Brexit are, are very few and far between, between. And I'm always rather grimly amused when I hear people like uh, Dominic Raab or um, Jacob Rees-Mogg talking about 10 or 50 years that we have to wait for the benefits of Brexit. Um, that reminds me very much, I'm afraid, of the apologists of East Germany and the USSR. They used to say, well, things aren't very good at the moment in the, in the Soviet Union. They're not very good in East Berlin. Um, but if we wait long enough, then the workers paradise will come into being. And that comparison with the totalitarianism of, of, of Marxism um, doesn't um, uh, seem to me to be an inappropriate comparison. I think there is an, an element um, of ideological culturism about today's Conservative Party. I'm afraid I have to agree with what the chairman said, um, that the Conservative Party, I don't think is, is any more uh, a respectable party. I think it was when it had respectable people like me in it. Um, Populism can very easily um, present itself as a, an authentic form of democracy. It's a particular form of democracy, it says, which takes into account um, the feelings and, and concerns of ordinary people. Well, that's a, a, a dangerous road to go down and can very easily lap over into authoritarianism. Um, and particularly, I think, in a country like our own, when there's so little in the way of checks on the, um, on the executive. And that's something I'll be talking about um, later on in the speech. Um, perhaps the um, first quotation that I mentioned, if you don't know where you're going to go, you may end up somewhere else, is even more relevant to Brexit. Um, because it's important to stress that there was never any guiding principle or any coherent analysis underlying Brexit other than possibly a, a superficial dislike of the European Union jealousy fostered by the, um, um, by the, 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 the Eurosceptic press. Um, of its nature, Brexit was a journey without an undefined destination. People talk about um, uh, Dominic Cummings, who obviously played such a role in the referendum, um, as being a strategic genius of some kind. Um, well, I don't know whether in general that's true or not, I'm not convinced. But one decision he did take that he got absolutely right, which was to say that the referendum could only be won if you didn't specify what the goal of Brexit was. 
because you couldn't possibly get a majority uh, for any particular vision of Brexit. Um, anybody um, who um, had their own vision of Brexit could cheerfully vote in favor of Brexit in the belief that it was going to be what they were going to get. But in fact, there were a whole range of views, some of which could never be reconciled with each other. Um, the most uh, extreme views were those people who said, I, I don't mean extreme in a moral sense necessarily, but just as two, two parts of the spectrum. Um, there was one set of views which said, well, we just don't want to be part of the political integration of the European Union. What we want to be is part of the, the economic arrangements. Um, <coughs> we don't want to be part of a United States of Europe, a federal Europe, but we're perfectly happy to continue pretty well as things are in the economic arrangements of the European Union. There was another view which said, and perhaps this was coming to you, um, that it was important to get as far away as possible from the dead hand of the European Union, that it was a corporatist, bureaucratic um, um, uh, octopus um, strangling the, um, the, the, the enterprise um, and enthusiasm um, of the British economy. Um, and those were two quite different views. They were as different as, uh, as the young lady who brings up her mother and says, I've had a row with my fiance. Um, I want to have a, a traditional church wedding with a Rolls Royce and go off to Jamaica for a, for a, a honeymoon. She says, well, what does he want to do? He wants to break off the engagement, she says. Well, those are the two extremes which could never be reconciled. And it must be said in fairness to Mrs. May, to Theresa May, um, that she attempted to um, bring these two extremes together. She was aware that there was a problem. I'm not saying she made a very good fist of trying to solve this incompatibility, but at least she was aware there was a difficulty. When we got to Boris Johnson, um, he was much more cheerfully willing to accept the moral and intellectual inconsistency between the various kinds of Brexit that people wanted. Um, um, a great example of this was Northern Ireland where having signed up for an arrangement which contrary to Mrs. May's um, proposition, um, produced a, a border, a, a frontier if you like, in the middle of the Irish Sea, he then denied that. Um, and perhaps, and I'll talk later about that, it's his intention to undermine um, this, um, um, this uh, uh, agreement. Um, I freely confess that, that I didn't think there would be any agreement and perhaps some of you have heard me saying so. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that I was entirely wrong in the sense that the agreement itself is so flimsy and, and so much an outline of what might happen um, that perhaps um, those people like myself who thought there would be no agreement weren't entirely wrong. Nor do I think it's impossible that this particular agreement is going to collapse in due course. I, I think there's a possibility wouldn't put it uh, as a certainty by any means, but I think there's a possibility that this government is moving towards um, uh, renouncing um, or at least undermining this agreement. Um, I've already mentioned the problems of touring museum musicians, of um, fishermen, farmers and the shellfish producers, but there are three elements of the agreement that I particularly like to, to dwell on, which I think bring out uh, how flimsy it is. The first element is that far from being a settlement um, of, um, of the, of the um, outstanding points between the European Union and the UK. It, it's very little more than an outline. It's a skeleton upon which um, many different kinds of clothes or flesh could be put. Um, there are literally dozens of committees that are going to implement and monitor the application of Brexit. Um, it's quite wrong to say that we know, even if the agreement survives, um, what Brexit will look like at the end of that time. Uh, it will depend very much on, on a, a myriad of decisions taken by these committees. Um, there's a, a one-year revocation right for either side of the uh, agreement, uh, and there's a, a five-year review of the agreement um, when a number of other decisions, particularly, um, particularly um, relating to fisheries, will be taken. Um, uh, most significant of all for the uh, provisional nature of the agreement, I think, are the level playing field provisions. These level playing provisions clearly derive from the fear of the European Union that the United Kingdom will use its position um, as having favored 
tariff-free, quota-free access to the internal market um, in order to, down, to dump for social dumping, as the EU would see it. Um, and they're not going to put up with that. And they have these rights of retaliation in terms of tariffs and quotas um, if they think that the United Kingdom is not living up to its obligations. Um, the whole of the agreement um, is, is full uh, of possibilities of suspension, of, um, uh, uh, of disapplication, um, of provisionality. It's very, very striking as you read it. The second point I'd make is about the um, Northern Ireland Protocol, which I've already referred to. Um, understandably, and at the um, urgings of the Irish government, um, the British government was put under a great deal of pressure by the European Union um, to agree to a special status for Northern Ireland, uh, a special status which would um, ensure that there wasn't a, a, a hard border, the return of a hard border in, 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 um, uh, in between the two parts of Ireland. Um, that acceptance of the Northern Ireland Protocol um, has always been a matter, obviously, of extreme unease for the British government. And just today we've had the news, the rather disconcerting news, um, that the British government intends to extend the various grace periods um, until at least October um, for applications of, of various provisions of the, um, of the protocol. Now that's not something that under the protocol the British government can do on its own. It's something that it's done unilaterally. Um, and it may well be in response to the ERG, the, Euro the European Research Group, who have said that the, the protocol should be dumped entirely. Now, this is quite significant uh, as a development. If there were any attempt to, to dump the protocol, then that would throw in doubt um, the whole um, ratification of the, um, uh, of the agreement, particularly by the European Parliament, who have all already postponed a decision on when they are going to have a ratification debate. So this is a, a, a very fragile and very vulnerable situation. It wouldn't surprise me at all if this becomes very serious over the next couple of days. Um, the British government or its apologists um, have tried to compare this uh, breach of the protocol with the attempt, um, uh, with the very short lived attempt to involve, invoke Article 16 about vaccines by the EU three weeks ago. There's really no parallel because that was something that was uh, revoked um, before it even came into force. Um, and it was something that um, everybody in the European Union um, recognizes was a mistake. The third element that I'd like to talk about is, um, is that of uh, financial services. Uh, financial services are not dealt with at all in the, uh, in the agreement. Um, and this is a, a, a very worrying development for the future of the city. Something like a tenth of the government's present income comes from the city. And if that were threatened, then, then obviously it would be a, an extremely worrying development. I think people in the city were, were much too optimistic uh, about retaining access to the um, to the European single market. Um, I think they wanted to be in the position of a, a fiance, male or female, um, who dumps um, the other party and sends back the love letters, but keeps the jewelry just for old time's sake. Um, I think it was not going to be possible simply to maintain um, the, pre the presence of, um, of the city at the, to the same extent um, as it has been until now, uh, very beneficially for the city. There are a lot of people in the European Union who think that it's a, a threat for the um, euro, and I can understand this view, um, to have um, so much of the financial services and transactions of the euro taking place outside the European, outside the eurozone. Um, there are opportunities for um, um, for Paris and for the Netherlands um, and for Frankfurt, of course, to take over some of the city of London's business. Um, and they're not um, very eager um, to, um, to let this chance go. Um, there's supposedly going to be in March the uh, agreement of a memorandum of understanding uh, about what access the European Union will give the city. Um, and I suspect it's going to be rather disappointing from the city's point of view. When the agreement came out, um, there are a number of commentators who speculated about whether the, the tendency of the committees that I've talked about, the implementing procedures of the, of, of the, of the agreement, um, would be um, tending towards um, convergence or divergence. 
I think it's pretty clear um, that the tendency of these uh, uh, of this agreement is going to be all towards greater divergence. We've seen it particularly in Northern Ireland. Um, and I think that the, the government have made it clear that one of the reasons why they favor Brexit apart from the internal uh, politicking of the Conservative Party, is that they see it uh, as an opportunity to strike out on their own, to have different standards uh, in a number of economic sectors. Um, and the city and financial um, services might well be one of them. Um, the EU has its own um, uh, envisaged program uh, of um, financial legislation coming up over the next four or five years, um, and it will be a rather strange thing if, if the British government were prepared being outside the European Union slavishly to follow these, um, uh, these regulations. Of course, uh, the, Europe, the Conservative government will be very much under pressure from the ERG um, to maximize divergence away from the European Union. That will make, among other things, it more difficult for Britain, for the, European, for the United Kingdom ever to rejoin the European Union. Um, and it's my impression, my definite impression, that the ERG um, within the Conservative Party always wins. They don't always win immediately, but the long-term de development of the Conservative Party is in the direction of what the ERG wants. The appointment of David Frost, of Lord Frost, um, is, it seems to me, um, very much a pointer in this direction. Um, I don't think you would um, appoint David Frost um, to be in charge uh, of the regular negotiations between the EU and the UK if convergence was, was your goal and your aim. Indeed, I, I predict something of a Cold War um, between the European Union and the United Kingdom coming to be the way in, in which this um, implementation of the agreement, if it survives, um, will, will take place. Um, I don't think that convergence is what this um, agreement is about. I think it's about the divergence. So the question is, um, what should we, we in the broader sense of people who were Remainers and still are Remainers in, in their ideas, what should we do? Well, I, I certainly don't think we should give way in any sense to resignation. Um, I think the idea that Brexit's done and now it's up to us to make it a go of it um, is mistaken on a number of levels. I don't think it's possible to make Brexit work. Um, I don't think it has any moral claim to make Brexit work. And I think it's a very strange thing um, for people who know the harm that Brexit is doing to their country to keep quiet about it. So I entirely agree with what was read out about the need for the European movement um, to point out um, the, the failings and the problems of Brexit. But I would go further. I would go further and say, that we must point out that the only way in which these problems can be remedied is by rejoining the European Union. Uh, I know there's a view which says that at the moment it's so politically unrealistic to join the European, rejoin the European Union, that the way to go about it is perhaps to advocate um, uh, rejoining the single market, rejoining the customs union, and then very gradually getting into the way of, of people's understanding um, that there are common values and common interests between the EU and the UK. Um, I don't believe that. Um, I think that um, uh, uh, it won't make any difference to the political presentation of the case for rejoin to be seen, to be mealy mouthed about it. Uh, I think you might as well be hung for a sheep as a lamb. And I think that it's only really within circles like our own where people already have their minds made up that the distinction between the, the commercial, the, the customs union and the single market and being in the European Union really matters. I think that if the European movement or other organizations press um, for a stage return to the, Europe, to the European Union, um, they will still be presented by the, the Conservative government uh, as being Ramoners, Remainers, people who've never um, accepted Brexit outcome. Um, and I think um, there's no particular reason why in a democracy we should accept for all time um, the Brexit outcome, um, of the, uh, the outcome of the, of the Brexit referendum. Um, I know that the Labour Party have taken the view um, that they rather hope that it'll be possible to get through the next four years without talking about Europe. Uh, I think that's wrong. 
I don't think that they'll be able to do so. Um, and I think that um, simply taking the um, uh, the tone, their tone from Boris Johnson will make make um, Keir Starmer appear weak um, and uncertain. Um, on the other hand, I'm not a member of the Labour Party. It's not up to me to, to, to advocate particularly where they think their political interests lie. But what I am sure about or much sure about is that voluntary organizations, which don't have these political calculations in mind, um, should be uh, unambiguous, not merely in saying that um, there are problems associated with Brexit, but that we see the only way of remedying these problems uh, as being to rejoin as soon as possible. Now, a, a question that's um, then put to me uh, very reasonably, and I'm sure someone will put it, is would the rest of the European Union want us back? To which um, I have to say that I don't think in the present state of British politics, um, they would. Now, since the present state of politi British politics are not going to allow us to make an application to, reju to rejoin, this is something of, of a circular question. So um, uh, the, the one excludes the other. Um, but what I do think, um, and this will come back to federalism and the federal trust, um, is that, that um, it's only if we have a rather different political system to the one we have at the moment, that it will be possible to generate a uh, 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 a movement to rejoin the European Union, and it will only be possible to make an application that the European Union is likely to accept. Because from their point of view, um, a country in which 40% um, uh, of the electorate, not even 40% of the electorate, 40% of those people voting um, will be a conservative bloc that almost inevitably under our particular system will ensure that they get an, a, a majority um, will not be a system that can guarantee stable um, adherence to the European Union, even if, um, which I'm not at all sure of, um, at the next election, Labour were to get a majority. Um, who's to say that within two or three years, um, there wouldn't be a, a conservative majority returning and a conservative government um, defines itself and must always define itself by its hostility to, to European um, to, to European Union uh, and to European integration. Um, so uh, my own hope, and I don't think it's an entirely implausible one, um, is that the, there will be some sort of electoral alliance, an anti-conservative electoral alliance um, before the next election. Um, which will give a really good chance to the 60% of, of people voting um, who do, would, would, won't want the Conservatives to be returned um, to, to get a majority. And th that majority will probably have the Labour Party as its biggest, um, as its biggest component. Uh, but I can see the Greens and perhaps some new parties and the Liberal Democrats also being part of this, if you will, progressive alliance. Um, I think, that, however, um, that there are a couple of things that this um, new progressive alliance should do in addition um, to committing to rejoin the European Union. One should be committing itself to a change in the voting system, not necessarily to proportional representation. It might be that a second round um, would be a, a, a better way of ensuring um, that there's a, a good spread um, of seats in the new parliament. Um, and also, um, I think that um, if the continuity and unity of the United Kingdom is to be preserved. Um, I think that um, there needs to be a great deal more in the way of decentralization, devolution, and perhaps federalism. Um, federalism, which the Federal Trust advocates, um, is a system of allocation of responsibilities between the center and the periphery and the regions. Um, and what makes federalism so specific is that these powers at the, at, the, at the central level and at the regional level uh, are um, guaranteed constitutionally. It's not up to the central government to decide um, what its powers are, as is the case in this country. And I think that's something which contributes to stability and moderation uh, within polities. Uh, I think that the United States um, would, have, would have been uh, in a much worse position 
to deal with the historical aberration of Donald Trump had it not had a robust federal system, many other systems of power um, and legitimacy uh, in addition to the, the central government. So um, I can envisage, um, and I think it will be good for the country if it happens and bad if it doesn't, um, uh, a general election fought in, in 2024, or perhaps before, perhaps before, um, in which the um, political configuration will look rather different to the way it does now, that there will be a, a proper electoral coalition between the anti-conservative forces, and that will have a, um, a constitutional agenda, which will make a great deal of difference both to our rejoining the European Union uh, and to um, uh, all other aspects of our political life. Well, well thank you very much um, for listening to me. I, I can now give my second favorite um, Sam Goldwyn quote, um, which is to say that I have a lot of, he, he says that he has a lot of people working for him, um, but he doesn't want yes men, he wants people to tell him the truth, even if it costs them their job. Well, I hope there won't be too many yes men um, in the questions. I imagine there won't be lots of people will be disagreeing. Um, if you think you've agreed with everything, you haven't been paying attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, thank you, Brendan. Uh, this is very stimulating. <coughs> there are quite a few questions about the whole issue of how do we get heard? How do we get the closer alliance with Europe, indeed the Remainer, or indeed the rejoiner message heard when the press is basically on the other side, the popular press, that is. What do we do? Um, I think sometimes um, we ourselves on our side of the argument um, have been afraid of controversy. We've been wanting to accept too much of the terms um, of the debate dictated by our opponents. And federalism is a very good example of that. A lot of people say, uh, well, I'm all in favor of the European Union, but I don't want federalism. I'm afraid, Mr. Chairman, you yourself came, came quite near to saying it um, in the introduction. Um, I, I think that we should be more honest with the electorate saying, um, that the European Union is not simply um, an economic arrangement, it, it's a political and cultural arrangement as well, which has important central institutions. And I think that that might pick up um, a bit more in the way of traction. Uh, one of the reasons why um, uh, Farage always managed to get on um, television was that people knew that he'd say something outrageous. That, that it's true that the great majority of the British press um, are um, mindless, and I, I say that without apology, mindless, uh, um, uh, unreflecting perhaps better, um, uh, uh, Brexiteers. Um, but nevertheless, um, if something is put sufficiently controversially um, and unashamedly and unabashedly, um, there is a certain interest in the press um, in controversy. Um, and I think that we, uh, on our side of the argument, have been um, unwilling, too unwilling to engage in controversy. We've always been too apologetic. Um, I have very rarely heard um, a, uh, a pro, uh, uh, pro remain or pro um, people's vote individual um, uh, speaking about the European Union without saying, of course, the European Union isn't perfect. Um, I want to have a reform in the European Union. Um, I think it's our lack of self-confidence that sometimes um, betrays us. And that's why I'm eager to say um, that we shouldn't hesitate to say that we want to rejoin. Um, and if people don't like it, well, fine, um, because then that sets up a controversy. <clears throat> it's also well, the case that um, uh, we, it seems to me, um, have to be active in trying to persuade the Labour Party, who are a most important vehicle um, of, of our potential vehicle um, of, our, uh, of our message. Um, and I think we should make it clear, as, as it were, rejoiners, um, that our vote for the Labour Party or for the Liberal Democrats or for the Greens or whoever it is, is not to be taken for granted unless 
Um, they give us what we want on, on rejoin. Uh, if you ask me, do I know um, how it's going to be possible to mimic um, the success of UKIP over the past 15 or 20 years, um, I'm not sure I know. But I don't think they knew either at the beginning of their, as they would see it, crusade. Um, I, I think, think that um, oh, what we have to do, so, sorry, can I just one more, one, one yeah. more, more, more sentence, yeah. sorry to have gone on, but it's a crucial question and, and you, you did insist on it. Um, um, I, I, I think we have to be more um, confidently outspoken in our commitment to the European values and to the European Union as it is, not merely as some people would like to pretend it is.